اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين واصلي واسلم على من بعث رحمه للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته brothers and sisters and welcome to what is part 16 of our quranic synopsis where we go through the quran juz by juz and cover what is covered therein um, that sort of gives us a structure with regards to the Quran and roadmap and gives us a, a sort of a working plan as to how the Quran was put together. Uh, Insha'Allah ta'ala. Uh, so we have reached um, Surah Al-Kahf. So in this particular part, we're going to cover the rest of Surah Al-Kahf. We covered quite a, a bit of it yesterday, although uh, quite briefly in the last sort of 10 minutes or so. Um, and we are going to cover Surah Maryam and finally finish off with Surah Al-Taha uh, in its entirety. So Taha and Maryam and Gaf are going to be the order of the day today, inshallah ta'ala. So we said yesterday uh, a little bit about uh, Surah Al-Kahf and its uh, context in which it was revealed in. And we said that it was one of the earlier surahs to be revealed. And we, at, the, at the moment, what we're doing right now, or we're, the process that we're in right now in terms of the Quran, is we're going through a, a series of consecutive Makkan surahs. Right, many of them that have pre preceded uh, have been revealed late on in the Meccan period, so close to the Hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and this is kind of like the first few that we're going to see that have been revealed at the early stages of the Meccan period, when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had either just come out of sort of giving da'wah to his companions in secrecy, where he was in a place called. Um, uh, uh, Dar al Arqam, uh, Ibn al Arqam. Uh, so, this, this house of al Arqam, uh, where the Prophet used to gather with his companions and used to teach each other the Quran and learn the Quran of each other, and they would go to their homes and then study it together and then go back to the Prophet uh, uh, in the evenings, for example, in the afternoons, uh, and then learn from him again, like that. So, uh, uh, and then just thereafter, the Prophet came out, and we're going to see a little bit later when we get to Surah Maryam and when we get to Surah Taha, especially. Uh, where the da'wah of the Prophet became um, sort of apparent and he was no longer doing it in secrecy, rather he was doing it uh, face to face and he was doing it openly now uh, to all the people of Mecca. Uh, so Surah Al-Kahf is one of those that was revealed in the earlier periods. Uh, it was at the time when uh, the Prophet sallallahu had uh, either uh, just before the um, uh, uh, the migration to Habasha or after that. Uh, and we said earlier in a couple of other uh, lessons that the Meccan period is defined by certain events that took place in certain years. So one of those events is when the Prophet Sallallahu he came out um, from the da'wah secret, secretly, which was in the third year of prophethood. Uh, another one is the migration to Habasha, which is in the fifth year of prophethood. Another one is the Amr al-Huzn, where the uh, Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as well as Khadija radiallahu anha, his beloved wife, passed away, which is in the tenth year of the Hijrah. Uh, and others are like the Isra and Mi'raj that happened in the twelfth year of the Hijrah, and so on and so forth. So these events they kind of help us to calculate and coordinate where the surahs roughly were revealed, and the kind of context context that they were revealed in, uh, and under what circumstances. So Surah Al-Kahf was revealed at around about the time. Uh, where the uh, Muslims were first migrating uh, to Habasha or thereafter. Uh, and we said that there are four stories, four stories in this particular surah, the stories of the people of the cave, the story of um, uh, the man with two gardens, uh, the story of Musa and Khadr, and that's what we completed yesterday. And we said that, uh, and the fourth story that we're going to cover is the story of Dhul Qarnayn. Now, we said that the stories, these stories are significant or they signify um, the, the kind of things that were happening amongst Quraysh at the time. Uh, and they were in very much in correlation with what was happening uh, with regards to the people of Mecca and the Muslims at the time. So the people of the cave, they were young men who went out and they wanted to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And they recognized the batil, the falsehood and the oppression and transgression that their people were upon and how they wanted to... Uh, sort of change their ways and change the ways of their people, but they were uh, They weren't people of any power or anything like that. Just like the Muslims didn't have any power. They didn't have any status They didn't have any uh, sort of economic might with regards to their people rather They were just many of them were poor uh, or they were just sort of, you know, average people from their uh, their, their, their communities uh, and it was only very few of them that had some form of 
you know, uh, clout amongst the Meccans, like Uthman ibn Affan and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And then later on, uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab, uh, when he uh, entered into Islam, but that was very, uh, years later, uh, after the, uh, the revelation of the Qur'an. So it very much shows the, what the, the, the Muslims were dealing with in that story. So there's a lot that the Muslims could take from that. Uh, also, the man with two gardens is a, a story about money, commerce, and economy. Uh, the man with two gardens, his ideology and his understanding of what his wealth meant to him. Uh, and he, his, what his wealth did was deceive him into thinking that he was in control of his own life and his own destiny. And that this was all there was to life. The, 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 the gardens that he had been given, the crops that he had been given, the, the, the rivers that were flowing through his land, the abundance that he had been given, and the fact that people were flocking in from all over the area just to seek the provisions that he had in his land. And they would buy and sell from him. So he was a very, very rich man. And he thought that things couldn't get better than this. So that led him to disbelieve in anything called the hereafter. And uh, ultimately disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and as soon as he did that, he began to put others down, think that he is better than others. And the pride and arrogance took over him just as it had taken over Satan before him. And so that was his demise. And just like that, the, the same thing happened with the people of Mecca. Uh, they were in charge of the commerce. People used to flock from miles around to make a, uh, to make a pilgrimage to the sacred house uh, and worship their idols therein. And when they used to come, they used to come with their own commerce and with their own money. And they used to, they used to uh, slaughter cattle and sheep and camels and so on and so forth for their gods. And this was a, uh, as a, well, this was a great form of income uh, for the pagans in Mecca. So just like that, they were haughty, pride and arrogant, proud and arrogant, and they would put down the Muslims and those who were less fortunate than they were and had less wealth and commerce than they had. And that ultimately led them to, believe, uh, to disbelieve in anything called the hereafter and ultimately disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and so the warner came to them uh, just like uh, the warner came to that man with two gardens. And then the, finally, the, the, the third story was the one we took yesterday uh, was about Musa and Khadr. And Musa and Khadr, we said it was about knowledge, right? Musa alayhi salam was endowed with knowledge and revelation. And he was told that there was someone who had been given knowledge that he did not have. And his name was Khidr, and you can search for him in X location. So he went out to search for this man. And when he found him, he studied from him, he learned from him, and he showed him ways in which he couldn't understand. Uh, that is about knowledge. That is about understanding that when revelation uh, comes to you, there is someone who has come to you with knowledge that you don't have. And you have to have humility just as Musa alayhi salam had humility with Khadr, right? Even though Musa alayhi salam was in a position of authority because he was the one who had been given revelation. He could have gone to Khadr and said, Ya Khadr, I am a messenger sent from Allah and he has ordered me to learn from what he has taught you. So teach me what he has taught you. I command you <laughs> by the command of Allah. And that'll be the end of it. Khadr has no choice but to tell him and teach him. But he didn't. He went with him, up to him with the utmost humility to learn from him. And he asked him questions that were perhaps not in the right place of asking, but he learnt nonetheless, and he learnt more than what he set out to learn in the first place. Right? So just like that, these people of Quraysh have, uh, they have that position of authority. Right? Uh, they, should uh, they should humble themselves with the Prophet ﷺ in order to learn what it is that is being revealed to him. And if they don't humble themselves, they are going to ask questions that are not in the right place. Right? And they are going to say things that aren't uh, sort of timely to say. Uh, but in fact, they didn't even do any of that. They just pushed him away, persecuted him and killed his followers. Uh, so what a, <laughs> subhanAllah, a tragic um, a contrast that is. Now the, the fourth and final story is the story of Dhul Qarnayn. And we said in the backdrop to this that the, this, was a, this was something that the pagans would ask the Jews about. Tell us something about uh, the, the prophet, this guy who claims that he's a prophet. Tell us something or, that we can ask him in order to, uh, to, to, sh to show him up, to show that he doesn't actually know anything and that nothing is actually truly revealed to him. Um, and so they asked, they told him about uh, three or four things. One of those things was Dhul Qarnayn. Ask him about Dhul Qarnayn and what was his reality. And Dhul Qarnayn is a story about a governance and leadership. Dhul Qarnayn was a king who the sun rose on his kingdom and set on his kingdom. And he was a just king. He wasn't someone who was a tyrant. He 
He wasn't someone who, when he was given that authority and that leadership, he did whatever he pleased with it, and he decided to use it for his own personal gains. No, rather he was a king who was at the service of his people. To the point where there are three events that took place in this story. The first event is that he goes to uh, He goes to the west, right? So one story, he goes to the far west of his kingdom. And the second story is he goes to the far east of his kingdom. And the third story is that he goes somewhere in the middle, right? Uh, this the, the story where he goes in the, uh, the to the west is وجدها تغرب في عين حمية وجد عندها قوم قلنا يا ذا القرنين إما أن تعذب وإما أن تتخذ فيهم حسنا قال أما من ظلم so he found a people that had uh, they they were transgressing right they, they he found a people that from amongst these people there were people who would uh, unjustly take the wealth of others uh, they would take the property of others. And they would be sort of, you know, tyrants in their own right. So uh, Dhul Qarnayn was asked for help, right, from him, uh, that can he help them in this situation, right? So it, uh, Dhul Qarnayn was given a choice, either to punish this people or to allow these people to go scot-free. And so he made the decision of the people who were oppressive and the wrongdoers, they were the ones who were going to get punished. And those who were, you know, sort of the, the oppressed and those who were doing right, then they will be um, sort of rewarded for their, their good conduct and their, for, their, for their moral uprightness. So this basically is a story of justice, that with leadership, you have to uh, command justice with those whom you are leading. That is your responsibility. It is not to uh, favor some over others whether that be because of their wealth or because of their strength or because of whatever it is, whatever the case may be. Rather, you are there in that position of leadership in order to enact justice. The second one was when he goes to the, uh, the, uh, the East. ثم أتبع سبب حتى إذا بلغ مطلع الشمس وجدها تطلع على قوم لم نجعل لهم من دونها سترة uh, so he, he found the uh, he found a people there that the sun rose on them and it there was no barrier between them and the sun. Now this could mean one of two things: either that they had no sort of uh, place of residence, so they lived in an open expanse and they didn't have any houses, right? So they were homeless, or this could mean that they had no clothes, so they were in extremely uh, impoverished people. Whichever way you look at it, they were poor people and they were very very poor. So he went and he uh, rectified their situation for them, either by building them uh, houses if they had none, or by providing for them clothing that could protect them from the heat and from the cold uh, whenever that came about. Uh, and this shows that the, when you're in a position of leadership, that you should look out for those who are the most impoverished from amongst you. It's not about just catering for the rich and pandering to the, to the major corporations and those who have you know, loads of money. Rather, it is looking out for those who are most needy in your society and catering for their needs. That is one of the most important responsibilities for a leader. And that is something that the Quraysh didn't do. Rather, they persecuted and took advantage of those who are less fortunate than they were. And finally, the third one was the story of those people who were in the middle somewhere. Um, and these people were an ignorant people. They were a people who didn't understand much. Uh, uh, they were, they were, it was as if they couldn't understand the word that was being said to them, right? So they were very ignorant people. This is a kind of like a, a, an analogy for ignorance. There are people called Ya'juj and Ma'juj. I'm not going to go into them in any detail. There's you guys who like who love like sort of like the signs of the last hour and stuff like that. Uh, you know, we'll, maybe, perhaps we'll talk about it at a different different stage, inshallah. But this, these people, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they were causing them a lot of grief, right? So they were coming and they were raiding their town and taking from their livestock and so on and so forth, right? And because they were an ignorant people, they they didn't know how best to uh, counteract. Uh, this uh, oppression that was happening from these people, Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So they asked uh, Dhul Qarnayn for help. We will give you a reward if you help us to build a barrier between us and this people. So what's interesting is that uh, Dhul Qarnayn, he says to them, Whatever my Lord has given me and made me strong in, that is enough. 
for me, right? So he's given me a dominion over this land and I don't need anything from you guys, which shows that when you're in a position of leadership, you don't need to take advantage of the wealth of those who you are leading. You should never look at what others have. Rather, you should look at what others need and require. Uh, so all he wanted was help, right? Just help me out. Let's work together, right? And that shows you that when you're in leadership, it's not about doing things on your own because you're a leader. Rather, it is about being able to lead others to help you and to become better. So he taught them how to build this dam with him. So he built this barrier, this dam that stopped or that was a barrier between them and the people of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And this was another thing that uh, was sort of a message to the Quraysh that look, just because you guys are in power doesn't mean that you should exploit those who are impoverished and who are coming from far uh, and wide to make pilgrimage and worship at the house of Allah. Whether they commit shirk or they don't commit shirk, but they are impoverished and you are taking advantage of their, their pilgrimage, right? And, and, and using it as a way of business. Uh, and that shouldn't be done. Um, and it also shows that, look, this guy, Dhul Qarnayn, he built an entire a wall, right? A barrier, a dam between this people and Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And even despite its, its size and its grandeur and what it was built out, built out of, all you have in your dis at your disposal are these houses that are surrounding a, a building that wasn't even built by you guys. <laughs> SubhanAllah. This is all you have, right, in your power to do. Right? You have no, like, skyscrapers and, you know, no Great Wall of Chinas and none of this stuff. Yet you have this pr pride and arrogance in you that would anybody would think that you have created something that no one else can create. SubhanAllah. So humble yourselves uh, in your position of authority. Uh, anyway, so then that's the, that's the last and final uh, story that comes about. It's a story about governance and about leadership and what you, a person should do with regards to when they are in that position of leadership. And we recite this surah every Friday, right? Every Friday we're supposed to recite this surah. So we're, we're supposed to remind ourselves of what it means to, for society for, to function. What is required upon us, right? So we have to, we have to be, be ready to, 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 to fight for what we believe in to call out and speak the truth whenever we have the opportunity to do so, right? It has to be done. And that was in the story of the people of the cave. Uh, even if we are going to face persecution because of it, we have to. That's the first thing. The second thing, so we have to be courageous. The second thing is that we have to, uh, when we are endowed with wealth, be responsible with that wealth. And no form of pride or arrogance should enter into our hearts because of the wealth that we own. Rather, what we should do is we should humble ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this wealth because it is all from Him, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one that has apportioned this rizq and this provision to whoever He wills. So for some, He has given X amount and for others, He has given maybe more and maybe less. Whatever the case may be, it is all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if it's all from Him, then we should praise Him and give Him thanks for what He has given and we should assist those who don't have what He has given us. And then the third one is that we should all excel and endeavor to increase in our knowledge and to understand the way of the world, whether that be in the deen, and first and foremost, it's the deen, right? Uh, or whether that be in the dunya. Uh, so, so learning all the new ways of, uh, of, of how things are done, right? So the technologies and the engineering aspect of things, the, the medicinal aspect of things. I know Dr. Imran is, uh, is in the house, mashallah, so he knows well going there. So all of these things we should excel in, in doing. And mashallah, I think the Muslims are pretty good uh, at doing that now, alhamdulillah. We're kind of on our way. And the, third, and the fourth and final thing is when we are in positions of governance, which we don't do very well and we do very badly. When we are in positions of governance, what are we supposed to do when we are in that position? Right? We are there at the service of mankind, just like the Prophet wasallam, who, if he wanted to, could have had the dunya and everything in it laid, to it, laid at his feet. And that is what Jibreel alayhi salam, he came to the Prophet sallallahu with. He said to him that, do you want to be um, a, 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 a prophet and a king or a messenger uh, and a servant? Right? And he chose to be a messenger and a servant. So he could have been the king of kings. But that was his way. And thus he laid down the sort of the, the bar for the rest of his ummah to follow. SubhanAllah. And then Surah Al-Kaf concludes with a number of things. 
um, mainly what is awaiting those who have disbelieved in the Prophet Sallallahu and turned their backs on him, uh, that they are those who they think they're doing the right thing, but in actual fact, they are the furthest from the truth. Should I not tell you and should I not inform you of those who are the, the most at loss with regards to their actions? Right? The losers, the true losers. Who are the true losers? الَّذِينَ ضَلَّ سَعْيُهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ يَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ يُحْسِنُونَ صُنْعًا They are those who uh, their efforts have gone astray. Right? They are doing the completely wrong thing. فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا In this life. وَهُمْ يَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ يُحْسِنُونَ صُنْعًا But they believe that they are manufacturing something that is amazing. Something that is good. Something that is worthwhile. أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ وَلِقَائِهِ فَحَبِطَتْ أَعْمَالُهُمْ فَلَا نُقِيمُ لَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَزْنَا They are those who have disbelieved uh, in the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and in his meeting. فَحَبِطَتْ uh, أَعْمَالُهُمْ So their actions are haba'an manthura, they are gone in the wind. And then the final verse of this surah is قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشُرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ Say to them that I am just a mere mortal, right? After the Prophet Sallallahu having told them all of the things that he shouldn't have known, right? Telling them the things of the unseen, that look, this is what happened with Musa and Khidr. This is what happened with Al-Qarnayn. And remember, this is at the early Meccan period where the Prophet Sallallahu is not living amongst the Jews to hear this thing from Ahl Al-Kitab, right? SubhanAllah. Rather, he is just telling them out of revelation. So even after this, he's telling, look, I'm just a man, right? قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ I am a man like you. But the only difference between me and you is yuha ilay. Revelation comes to me. And this is how the Prophet ﷺ went from being just a man like you, like you, like us, to a man like us, but not like us. SubhanAllah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Annama ilahukum ilahu wahid. That is what has been revealed to me. That your Lord is only one Lord. فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ So whoever wishes to meet his Lord, فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا Then let him... Uh, do righteous deeds and do good. Wala yushrik bi ibadati rabbihi ahada and let him not associate any partners in worship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that concludes Surah Al Kahf. And then we go into Surah, Al Surah, Surah Maryam. Now, Surah Maryam, obviously named after Mary, uh, the mother of Isa alayhi salam. Uh, and the, it's called thus because her story is documented here. We mentioned briefly some of her. Her story in Surah Ali Imran uh, a long time ago now, it seems like about two weeks ago now. Um, but we mentioned a little bit about her story uh, with regards to Imran and Zakaria and the conversation that took place there and then Yahya being born after. Here uh, in this story, in this surah, uh, the, the life of Maryam is documented in a little bit more detail with regards to the, the build up to her giving birth to Isa alayhi salam and the consequential birth thereafter. Uh, it was revealed. This surah was revealed, or many of its ayat were revealed around about the fourth year of the Hijrah. So just before the migration to uh, Habasha, the first migration to Habasha. And it was at a time where the Muslims were being persecuted and persecuted on another level, right? So at the beginning, when the Prophet ﷺ made the call that, you know, he was a messenger, he was faced with ridicule, right? And people would just like sort of make fun of him when he prayed, you know, they'd take the mickey out of him, sallallahu alayhi wa that sort of thing, right? Really like sort of mock him. Um, and denigrate him in, in, in those sorts of ways. And slowly it would escalate to actually sort of disgracing him. So throwing uh, bits of dead camel intestines on his back while he prays and that sort of thing, like really putting him down. And then when he got a few followers, they started to, uh, to, to, to sort of um, to bully and marginalize these followers as well. To the point where uh, there was a man called Khabbab. And Khabbab, he worked uh, for one of the heads of the Mushrikun. Um, he did some work in his garden or in his fields or, or something like that. And it, he was supposed to get a wage. But Khabbab had already accepted Islam and it was known that this Khabbab guy, he was a Muslim. Right? So when he went uh, to, I think it was Wa'il ibn As, uh, don't quote me on that though, he's the father of Amr ibn Al-As. Uh, he was working for him. When he went to him for his wage, uh, he said to him, he said to Khabbab that I'm not going to give you any of your wages because you are a Muslim. And until you denounce uh, Muhammad as a messenger of God, then you will get your wage. But until then, you're not getting anything from me. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ and said, look, you know, 
this is enough. The Prophet was in the in the, in Mecca at the time in the Masjid al Haram, and he went up to the Prophet and said, "Look, enough's enough." Ya Rasulullah, like you know, their 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 persecution is just their their you know their their prejudice now is is reaching another level, right? They are being so racist right now. So can you not pray to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for us? So the Prophet looked at Khabab and he said, "You know what? The people before us." From Bani Israel, they were punished with way more than you were punished with. They were persecuted with way more than what you are receiving right now, right? Uh, and he he sort of described some of the things that happened to Bani Israel, and he said that. But you guys are very, you guys are, are an impatient people, right? And he's saying this about his uh, his own followers, Subhanallah. That look, guys, man, just be patient, all right? This is just this is just the beginning. We haven't even come out with like you know this is what Islam is all about and let's go and uh, you know. Things haven't got serious yet. These guys are going to try and kill us one day. <laughs> All they're doing is stopping your wages right now, but it's going to get worse. So just be patient, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show us the way, inshallah. So, um, uh, so that's kind of the context in which it was revealed in, right? And this very surah was the same surah that the Muslims went with, with to, to Habasha. And when they migrated to Habasha, they migrated because it was getting really bad. And the persecution levels had increased, 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 not just from stopping your wages, but actually now physical beatings in the street. So they were like lynch, lynch mobs walking around the streets of Mecca. If they see a Muslim walking on his own, he's got it, right? And obviously we know the, uh, the story of uh, Sumayya and Yasir and Ammar, his family, and what happened to them and so on and so forth. So the persecution was getting worse and worse and worse and worse, and worse as time went on. So it got to a point where uh, the Muslims, they couldn't take it. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had been received permission to allow them to migrate to a place called Habasha. And then Habasha was uh, the Nijus, who was a, a righteous king of the Christian faith. And he was a good guy because he didn't oppress those wayfarers who came to seek protection under his rule and under his governance and leadership. So the Prophet said uh, to his companions that, look, if whoever wishes to go and migrate to Habasha, they can go and they can go to this king for verily, he does not oppress those subjects who are under him. So they went. And there was about 11 or 12 of them that went to uh, uh, Habasha uh, in, the first, uh, in the first instance. And there was another, another migration thereafter as well that took place. But anyway, so they, they, they traveled to, to Habasha uh, and uh, there, uh, happened, um, there happened some, uh, a few events. One of those things was that the Meccans were really disappointed that the Muslims managed to migrate and uh, sort of uh, 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 slip through their fingers. So they sent uh, Amr bin Al-As, who was the son of Wa'il ibn As, uh, Amr ibn As, um, who um, uh, went to, where did he go? He went to, uh, he went to Habasha behind them. Sorry, my mind went uh, somewhere else there. <laughs> so he went to Habasha after them. And he had dealings with uh, the Najashi before this, right? Uh, and he had visited him before and the Najashi knew him personally. And so he went and he took with him all these gifts. And there was another man that went with him. I can't remember his name uh, off the top of my head, but uh, there were two of them that went. And they went with the sole purpose of going to Najashi and convincing him to allow them to take back this handful of people who had slipped through their fingers and sought refuge with Najashi so that they can take them back and persecute them again back in uh, Mecca. And so uh, he went and when he arrived in, in Habasha, he went straight to the court of Najashi and he gave gifts to all of his uh, chief ministers and his advisors and he butted them up and they were all very happy to see him. And he gave the Najashi himself uh, a lot of gifts. And so the Najashi asked him, what brought you here, Ya Amr? And Amr told him that, look, there is a bunch of, um, uh, of brats, right? And that's literally what he called them. Young people who are uh, disobedient to their parents or to their elders, right? There's a bunch of these people that have, uh, you know, they have, they have left our religion and they are, haven't uh, come into your religion. Rather, they have invented a new religion, an entirely new religion that neither we know or you know. Uh, and so they have done some very, very, you know, bad things. And, you know, they've, they, they've hurt us and they've insulted us and they came here without their, our permission. So we want to take them back uh, if you'd allow me to take them back. So Najashi was like, no. Uh, no one ever comes to my court, asks me for something, and I just give it to him without, you know, due process. So I have to hear their side of the story. So he brought them in. And from amongst them was uh, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, who was the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Very learned, very close to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He loved the Prophet and the Prophet loved him. Anyway, 
he uh, then recited some of the verses that came up uh, into this surah. He said, what is it that you guys believe? And so they recited the verses that are coming up into this surah, inshallah ta'ala. And let's go, uh, without further ado, uh, into what those, uh, what those verses are that he recited to Najashi. So the first part of this surah, from the, uh, from the beginning to about the verse number 40-odd, uh, is all about Isa alayhi salam, but with a prelude. So it talks about Zakaria, and it talks about the birth of Yahya, and then it talks about Maryam alayhi salam, uh, and how she, um, she was... Uh, endowed with this blessing of Isa alayhi salam uh, in her womb without uh, previously being married or without having going through any of the natural processes that you go to, to in order to conceive a child. So a miraculous birth happened and then Isa alayhi salam came and those were the verses in which uh, Ja'far and Abi Talib recited to an Najashi. So let's pick it up from the point where uh, Maryam alayhi salam's story starts. So it starts at verse number 16. Uh, and uh, recite and remember in your book, uh, Maryam. إِذِنْ تَبَدَتْ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا مَكَانًا شَرْقِيًّا So uh, she went or she left uh, her family and she went distant, she went to a distant place uh, in the east. فَاتَّخَذَتْ مِنْ دُونِهِمْ حِجَابًا فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشَرًا سَوِيًّا and what it means by she, she, she sort of, um, uh, she left her family or she left her place that she was residing in was that because she wanted to go to a place of seclusion, either for ibadah or either because uh, her, the, her time of the month had come, right? So she was going through a period and she would spend the time in Bayt al-Maqdis, in the masjid. And obviously uh, a person who is on her monthly cycle is not allowed to enter the masjid, just like a person who is junub who is in their natural state of, or ritual state of impurity, is not allowed to enter into the masjid. So she wasn't allowed to be in the masjid at the time, so she left the masjid in an easterly direction, uh, and she went there to, to, to wash herself and so on and so forth, and have a, uh, have a ritual bath and then come back. While she was doing that, uh, and while she had left, that's when uh, Jibreel alayhi salam, he came to Maryam alayhi salam. So, فَاتَّخَذَتْ مِنْ دُونِهِمْ حِجَابًا So she took a, a, a hijab so no one could see her while uh, this was going on. فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشْرًا سَوِيَّةً So Jibreel alayhi salam, he came to her in the form of a, uh, of a person, uh, of a young man who was uh, well proportioned, right? Which means that he was like, you know, of a, of a good build, uh, handsome features and so on and so forth. قَالَتْ إِنِّي عَوُذُ بِالرَّحْمَانِ مِنْكَ إِنْ كُنْتَ تَقِيَّةً So her iman straight away comes into action. She says, I seek refuge in Ar-Rahman from you. SubhanAllah. She was afraid. Like, who is this person that's come up on me? Right? Where no one else can see me as well. This is like, I don't want to be in this position. Hello, get out of my face. Right? So straight away she's like, A'udhu Billah, I seek refuge in Allah. But not in Allah, not using Allah's name. Rather using the name Ar-Rahman, the most merciful. And the reason why she used the word the most merciful is so that he, she might invoke in this person who has come to her uh, some form of mercy that look Ar Rahman, you know, is here and he's watching us. Like, you know, what do you want? Uh, I am a messenger sent from your Lord to gift to you Hulaman Zakiya, a child, a pure and um, uh, Zakiya, meaning like a purity, yeah, purity, a pure child, so pure from sin, pure from. Uh, sort of pure from any type of misguidance, right? Pure from uh, any type of uh, negativity. Everything about him is uh, light, guidance, and connectivity with Allah. قالت أن يكون لي غلام ولم يمسسني بشر ولم أكو بغية. How can it be that I am to conceive when no man has touched me, right? And what she means by this, no man has touched me is that I have not gotten married, right? Uh, and obviously she means by that in a halal way. Uh, and this is from also the, the taqwa of Maryam alayhi salam where she's not saying things word for word, right? We all know what she means, but she's not saying it out of her haya and out of her hishma, out of her shyness and bashfulness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So she says to him that I have not been married before, walam aku baghiya, and I'm not from those who do baghi and, uh, or bigha. And bigha is a type of like sort of prostitution. You have extramarital relations. I'm not someone who does extramarital relations, nor am I someone who has been married previously. So how on earth is this supposed to happen? That is how it is and that is how your Lord has decreed and it is for Allah. Easy. Nothing. 
So that we can make him a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a mercy from us. And it is something that is already being decreed, already been ordained. There's no changing it. So the pangs of labor. So there's a lot of talk about this, right? So it's like a, a, a shift, right? And an immediate shift from this thing taking place between her and Jibreel and then her suffering from labor, labor pangs. So some of the Mufassirun and some of those who like sort of are into the Israeliyah say that the, 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 the inception of her child uh, and the labor of Isa alayhi salam was almost instantaneous, right? So it was like within an hour. And some say, no, it was a natural period and it just skipped, the Quran just skipped that whole story uh, and just went straight to the, the, the labor, uh, the labor, uh, labor pangs. And she was someone who was very much a woman of seclusion. So she would worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on her own. And because of that seclusion uh, and because of that love of uh, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, people left her alone and weren't able to see uh, over the nine month period, the eight month period, nine month period of her actually uh, growing or this child growing inside of her. So anyway, so the, the labor pains took her to a place, to a place where, um, uh, uh, to a place where um, there was a, a palm tree. And this palm tree was, um, there was only the root of the palm tree left and it had no head to it. So I don't know if you know how like sort of the life of a palm tree goes, but when it gets to the end of its life or when it gets to an, uh, the winter period when it dies, the head of the palm falls off, right? So it's just like uh, uh, the Ra'as the al-Nakhl is gone. So it's just the, the stump of the tree, right? So it was winter time in which, the, uh, uh, which Maryam alayhi salam went to this place. And it was outside of the city. Uh, it was a little bit further away. It was behind a mountain, so the ahadith say as well. Uh, and there was just this one tree stump there. There was no other tree stump around, just this one tree stump. And so she went to it, right? And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, nakhl, right? The stump of the tree. It doesn't mention anything about the head. Uh, and she said, I wish that I had died before this and that I was uh, something that was forgotten in the annals of history, right? That I, wasn't, I didn't exist. That's what she's saying. And the, 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 the pangs of labor were so bad and the fear of, of, of that situation was, was so severe and so heavy on her heart. Because if you picture this, right? This, this young girl has been endowed with a child. Nothing has happened to her with regards to marriage, right? No intercourse. Uh, so she's thinking that, what is everyone going to say about me? She is a person who is close to Allah and worships Allah. So what is that going to do with regards to people's opinion of her? All of these things are going on. Then she's on her own and she's about to give birth to a baby. Like, how on earth can that happen as well? And how is she supposed to do that? And there's no one there to help her. There's no midwifery. There's nothing. And she's out there in the middle of nowhere and she's so afraid of her people because they know, you know, you know, we know what happens to, to adulterers, right? And they're going to they're gonna think that she, she, she committed adultery. So all this stuff is going through her head. And while that's going through her head, she wishes that she had, uh, she, had, uh, she had died rather than be in this position. Which kind of goes to show you that when things get really tough, it, even the most righteous from amongst us, they call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the most severe of ways. That a voice called from below her. They say that it is Isa السلام, who called from her when he came out of her, um, of her womb. And when she gave birth to him, he is the one who called to her and spoke. Right? And they say that it was Jibreel alayhis, alayhis salam, who was there also with her. So um, one of the two. Either, either case, they called out to her and said, Do not fear, for verily there is a stream that is flowing below you. And shake this, this the, 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 the stump of the tree. There will be fruits that will fall uh, for you. So you'll have all the water that you need in this deserted area. And you'll have all the food that you need in order to regain your strength. Ajeeb. Subhanallah. So eat and drink and be content. Be calm. Qarri'ayna, meaning like uh, your, your eyes are settled. Right? When your eyes are settled, what that means is basically, you know, you're happy, right? So be happy. You know, be, don't, be, don't be afraid. Don't be sad. And if you were to see anybody and meet anybody um, it, during this period or on your way back to the city, 
Say that I have, verily I have promised to Ar-Rahman, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most merciful, a fast. Uh, and what that means by, by fasting, what, they, what the Bani Israel used to do in their fast is that when they used to fast, they weren't allowed to speak to anybody. Right? Uh, so they would abstain from food and drink, and they would abstain from speaking to people as well. Right? Uh, so I will not speak to anybody after I have told you that I am fasting today. So she came to her people holding this baby. قَالُوا يَا مَرْيَمُ لَقَدْ جِئْتِ شَيْئًا فَرِيَّا You have come with something outrageous. Right? Fariya is like a um, uh, fidya, like a lie. Right? So uh, something that is uh, dishonest. You haven't been true to yourself. You haven't been true to your way. You were a person who was an abida, zahida, connected with Allah. And now you have come with this. Subhanallah, this is absolutely shocking. Terrible. يَا أُخْتَ هَارُونَ مَا كَانَ أَبُوكِ امْرَأَ سَوْءٍ وَمَا كَانَتْ أُمُّكِ بَغِيَّةٍ يَا أُخْتَ هَارُونَ أَوْ oh, سِسْتَ أَبْ هَارُونَ uh, سِسْتَ أَبْ هَارُونَ they, they used to call either Harun could either be one of two people either it could be Harun the, the brother of Musa because Maryam alayhi salam was from the bloodline of uh, Harun alayhi salam or it could be that uh, there was another person called Harun who was either righteous or immoral uh, one of the two um, and, and so they were either saying this because, look, you're supposed to be the daughter of Harun, and Harun was a messenger and prophet of Allah, righteous in all his characteristics. He was there as uh, a, a, an aid to Musa, and Musa could never have carried out his task without the help of Harun. You are his descendant, and this is what you've done? SubhanAllah. So they're basically putting her down by this. مَا كَانَ أَبُوكِ that, that your dad wasn't a, 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 a person of evil. He wasn't someone who committed, you know, uh, evil deeds. And your mother was never someone who adulterated, wasn't someone who uh, would have extramarital relations either. Meaning that she's putting, put it, they're putting Maryam down because of, uh, through her parents. And this is, this is a way of putting someone down in it. It's like the, the, the children of the Salihun, the children of the righteous, if they are also bad, it is even worse, right? So if, if, if the son of a sheikh or the daughter of a sheikh Right, turns out to be bad. It's like, oh, he's the son of Sheikh Fulan, right? And it's like, oh, that's a bad thing. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So that's kind of what's going on here. So she didn't say anything to him, right? Because she's fasting. So she points at Isa alayhi salam. قَالُوا كَيْفَ نُكَلِّمُ مَنْ كَانَ فِي الْمَهْدِ صَبِيَةً How can we talk to someone? How can we speak to someone who is in his cradle a child? قَالَ إِنِّي عَبْدُ اللَّهِ آتَانِيَ الْكِتَابَ وَجَعَلَنِي نَبِيَّةً And he spoke. Ajeeb, subhanAllah. He said to them, Inni Abdullah, I am a servant of Allah. He has given me the book. وَجَعَلَنِي نَبِيَّ And he's made me a prophet. Yani he's going to make me a prophet. Or he was made a prophet from, uh, uh, from childhood. Just like Yahya was. وَجَعَلَنِي مُبَارَكًا أَيْنَمَا كُنْتُ And he has made me blessed wherever I am. وَأَوْصَانِي بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ مَا دُمْتُ حَيَّ And he has advised me, encouraged me, commanded me with prayer and charity uh, for as long as I live. وَبَرًّا بِوَالِدَتِي Right? بِوَالِدَتِي only. And to be dutiful to my mother. Right? Not my parents, because it doesn't have a father. To be dutiful to, uh, to, uh, be dutiful to my mother. وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْنِي جَبَّارًا شَقِيًّا And he has not made me of those who are tyrannical uh, or those who despair. وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيَّ يَوْمَ وُلِدْتُ وَيَوْمَ أَمُوتُ وَيَوْمَ أُبَعَثُ حَيَّ And peace be to me the day in which I was born. Right? The day in which I die. And the day in which I will be raised, right? So uh, the Isa alayhi salam is going to be saved throughout his life. He's going to be saved uh, when he dies. So there's no adab al-qabr or anything like that in his barzakh. Uh, and on the day of judgment, there will be no, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, Jahannam will not approach him in the slightest. ذَلِكَ Isa ibn Maryam. That is Isa, the son of Maryam. قَوْلَ الْحَقِّ الَّذِي فِيهِ يَمْتَرُونَ that is the statement of truth in which they are all doubtful in, right? And these are ma kana lillahi an yattakhida min walad. It's not for Allah subhanahu wa taala to take a son or a child. Subhana, free is he from all deficiencies. Ida qada amran fa inna ma yaqulu lahu kun fa yakun. If he wishes for anything to take place, he merely says kun, and it is. He merely says be, and it is. He doesn't need to go through all of these processes. He doesn't need a child. He doesn't need any of that sort of stuff. No. If he wants to create something, he doesn't need a father. He doesn't need a mother. He doesn't need an egg and a sperm. If he wants to, he'll just create it like that. 
these are the verses that were recited upon Najashi. And when, when Najashi had these uh, verses being recited to him, he said, Wallahi, verily, this is, this is the same thing and that comes from the same source as what came to Isa alayhi salam, what has been revealed to this man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And verily, he is a prophet. And then he turned to Amr and said, I'm not going to let these guys go. All right? I'm not going to give these guys up to you. So they stay. Next day, Amr bin Al-As, he comes up to Najashi and he says to him, ya Najashi, these guys, they say about Isa alayhi salam, a very grave statement, right? And nothing that you say. So ask them about it. So he calls them. He's like, okay, what is it now? What is it that you say about Isa alayhi salam um, that is so grave? Uh, and so Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, he said in the next day that, look, we don't believe him to be son of God. We don't believe him to be one of three. Rather, he is a servant of Allah and his messenger that was given as a word in spirit to Maryam uh, uh, as a virgin. And so when he said that, he said, yep, this is it. This is what, uh, uh, what we believe also. So Amr, you go back to Mecca because I'm not going to give these people up for as long as I live. And so it was, they stayed in peace. Uh, Surah Maryam goes on from verse number 41 to 50 of mention of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now Ibrahim alayhi salam is also uh, sort of significant with regards to the whole Najashi and Habasha and the migration there is because uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam obviously the father of the Anbiya there but also Ibrahim alayhi salam was also um, expelled by his people right um, and set up to persecution by his people and by his own family as well so this is very much in relation to what the Muslims were going through at the time and the fact that they were going to have to migrate or if they did migrate, this was very much pertinent to the life of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So very much getting them in gear and getting their mind in place uh, for that. Um, then sort of towards the end of the surah, it is all about sort of the very harsh realities of what is going to happen to those who have rejected the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, turned their backs on the messenger and persecuted those who believe merely because they believed. Um, and it's very extensive. Uh, so have a look at it, inshallah, and very descriptive as well. Uh, and that leads us on to Surah Taha, uh, inshallah ta'ala. Let's take a quick breather and see what's happening uh, in the world of Zoom. Zoom only today, right? No YouTube, subhanAllah. Um, let's have a look at your questions, inshallah. Uh, okay, so Nassim is asking, uh, will the Dajjal be under Iblis's influence or will Iblis be under Dajjal's influence or are they partners in crime? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, whether they'll be under I the influence of the other. I suppose you could say that because Iblis, right, he is, he is the influence of all those who are coming after him, right? So all those in mankind, he is the influencer of them. So you could say that, yeah, definitely Dajjal is uh, under his influence. If the Dajjal is going to be uh, from the Shayateen. But sometimes... The, 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 the mankind the, from man could be influences over, over the shayateen as well. Um, when the shayateen, the yuhuna, zukhruf al qawli ghurura, ba'dhuhum ila ba'd. Okay, uh, Surah Maryam, verse number 54. Sabiha is asking, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِسْمَعِيلِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ وَكَانَ رَسُولَ النَّبِيَّةِ Ismail is mentioned as a prophet and messenger. Does that mean he has a different sharia to Ibrahim? And in fact, the people of Mecca were the followers of Ismail's sharia and not Ibrahim. Does that mean that he has a different sharia to Ibrahim? And in fact, the people of Mecca were the followers of Ismail's sharia and not Ibrahim? No. Uh, that, so this, the first part of your question is correct. Uh, so if uh, there is a difference between uh, someone being a Nabi and someone being a Rasul. Uh, and the old, the old adage of that Meaning that if Rasul and Nabi are mentioned at the same time They mean two different things And they, if they are mentioned separately from one another They mean one and the same thing So Rasul means a Nabi and a Nabi, and a nabi means Rasul right? So sometimes the Prophet is called the Nabi And sometimes he is called a Rasul right? But he is in fact obviously a messenger We know that for sure he's a messenger but a messenger doesn't necessarily mean, just because he has something new with regards to the sharia, doesn't necessarily mean that the previous sharia that is being followed is, uh, is none and void. And we associate the sharia of the person who comes after um, uh, and not with the person who comes before. Uh, so that's not the case uh, entirely. Um, also, the reason why the uh, sort of the, the, the people of Mecca were followers of the 
uh, oh, oh, I see your question now. Sorry, I'm going, I'm going into a tangent there. Uh, the people of Mecca were followers of Ismail Sharia. They weren't the followers of Ismail Sharia anyway. They were way deviant uh, with regards to him. But I, I think what you mean by back in the day, uh, at the time of Ismail, they were following Ismail. Yes, that, that is correct. Um, okay, Alhamdulillah. So you saved me from a, from a grave digression there. Uh, are there any more questions? MashaAllah, you guys are chilled out today. Uh, I did actually have a lot of questions yesterday, so should we have a look at those? Uh, inshallah. Um, let's see. How do I access them? New binet with regards to his phone, subhanAllah. Okay. Uh, so Muin, uh, is Muin here today? I, don't, I haven't seen any questions from him, mashallah. We're relaxed today, right? Because Muin's not in the house. Is he? I don't know. Let's have a look. Ah, he's missing today. He's missing today. So, yeah, we're relaxed with the questions. Okay, so one of the questions was, is all of humanity now the descendants of Noah? How did all of the animals fit onto the boat? Ark, did the flood kill all life in the whole planet? So yeah, all of the mankind after that were the descendants of Noah and his children. Um, how did the animals fit uh, on the boat and ark? Uh, it's kind of just squeezed them in, <laughs> I suppose. Uh, I don't really know the answer to that. They, they, they fitted, on, fitted in however they fitted in. Um, did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam physically go to heaven? Uh, or was this spiritual or in a dream? This is regard to Isra and Mi'raj yesterday. And we said, I think we covered that, isn't it? We said that he, he, he did go physically. If everything and destiny is bound to our neck and predetermined, uh, uh, the, the whole thing about your actions being bound to your neck. If everything is destined, destined and is bound to our neck and predetermined, uh, uh, on the sealed tablet, is that fixed or can dua change what is destined for us? Ah, a dua, can that change our destiny for us? Or is our destiny fixed without our duas? So you have to remember that when we make dua, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet said that dua can change your destiny, right? Uh, so um, when, we, when, when, uh, when the Prophet is talking about that, we have to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who changes the qadr, right? And we have to remember that He is not governed by time as we are. Right? So it may be that we are making dua for something now that we didn't make dua for in the past and we have this concept in our minds because we are governed by time and space. So we are governed by our past, present and our future. So we think that because we haven't made that dua yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't made that decision to change the qadr yet. So when we make dua, that's when Allah changes the qadr. That's not how it works. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's free of time. So this, I, this concept of before and after it doesn't. Uh, it is not associated with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, right? So changing the qadr in the future for him is like changing the qadr for us now, right? It, it, it's 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 happening all at once, right? And it's already it's already ordained that you're going to make du'a, and it's already ordained that your qadr has already been changed, and so on and so forth. Trust me, guys, qadr, right? When you think about it, is always going to lead your mind to go wild. Because it is something that is outside of your own capacity to, 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 to comprehend. And the reason why that is, is because we are governed by rules here in this, in this world, right? And we, we funnel everything that happens around us through the five apertures of our senses and through the framework of our mind that it is built upon. And all of that stuff is created. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his qadr is something that is beyond creation. And anything that is beyond creation, out the framework of our minds cannot get to. Our frame, the framework of our minds can't even get to Jannah and Nar, right? And Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And those things are created things. So how is it going to get beyond that? SubhanAllah. You know what I mean? Okay. Uh, okay, some more questions. So Naseem asked a question yesterday. Uh, yesterday I was trying to say how Allah will punish Iblis on the Day of Judgment. How Allah will punish Iblis on the Day of Judgment? He goes to Jahannam. Um, uh, there are some specifics about that But I, I can't record them off the top of my head Unfortunately, so I do apologize for that uh, What is the best position to seek dua To Allah? Is it the hands up To the sky? Is it close to the chest? Or is it head on floor In sujood? So all of those things are, are, are good um, Especially the, the head on the floor in sujood Because uh, that is the closest uh, Position that a person can be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, Aqrabu ma yukunu 
Al-abdu ila rabbihi wa huwa sajid So um, that's the, the closest that a person can possibly be Right? The lowest your head goes Is the closest that you can be to Rabb al-A'la Subhanallah um, But uh, generally speaking the Prophet would, would put his hands out As if like begging to Allah Like hands out You know when you ask something from someone Like oh can you please give me some bread Can you please give me some money Like that It's like that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala When you ask Allah you, you're, you're requesting You're begging You're humbling yourself to him Um uh, I know of a brother who lost their memory due to an accident. Will they still be accountable if they now don't follow Islam going forward from them? They will be considered of those who are from the marda, those who are sick, and uh, those whom the pen has been lifted off uh, until their either their memory has been returned um, or their uh, sort of the, the the faculty of their memory uh, comes back to them somehow. So they won't be held accountable for the things that they have forgotten. Right? Right? If we have forgotten or we make a mistake. Right? So this guy is forgotten not because he himself has forgotten out of heedlessness, because he's had an accident and that's causing him to forget. So Allah subhanahu wa is not going to hold this, these, these types of people to, to account, inshallah. The ruh in Surah Qadr is, is usually said to be about Jibreel alayhi salam in some tafsir. Yeah, so Jibreel alayhi salam, he is called in the Quran Ruh al Qudus, right? The uh, uh, sacred spirit from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and we were talking about the ruh that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala breathed into Adam and has breathed into all of us simultaneously as well. So there, those are two different things. Um, the term Ashraf ul Ashraf al Makhluqat. Does that imply mankind is better than all creation? And is this true? I'm not sure about better than all creation uh, Because man mankind has the tendency to be the worst of all creation So I definitely wouldn't use the word better I would say that he has been chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And that, way, that is where his sharaf is He has been given intellect and the faculty to understand And that is where his sharaf, the honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him That is where that is in uh, but as for him being better or worse, I, I, I wouldn't use that wording. Okay. Um, I'm conscious of time, and I know that uh, uh, Maghrib is coming up, and Surah Taha is coming uh, next. Uh, but we are at 8.30, and uh, I'm not sure if it would be wise to keep going, because uh, I don't want to cover things and, or, or miss out things as well. Uh, and Surah Taha is uh, one of the greatest surahs uh, for reasons which will be inshallah revealed tomorrow uh, So we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that with regards to uh, our synopsis inshallah um, We wanted to cover, well, I wanted personally to cover the story of Maryam alayhi salam Because it is told in this particular part of the Quran like it is not told anywhere else So it is worth stopping on uh, and stopping on that particular particular section inshallah ta'ala Uh, yes, indeed, I am checking the questions on Zoom, uh, Akhtari. I am indeed. Uh, are there questions that I've missed out? Uh, you have to let me know that. If there's something I've missed out, you might want to just type it again or paste it again. Copy and paste it again. Um, we'll take maybe one or two more questions and then we'll, we'll, we'll call that in a, a day, inshallah. Um, what's the difference between inshallah and bi'idhnillah? Uh, insha'Allah and bi'idhnillah Insha'Allah means uh, if Allah uh, The Mashi'ah of Allah If Allah wants it to happen uh, It will happen And bi'idhnillah is if Allah permits it to happen It will happen Both of them have different sort of like uh, Wordings But they mean one and the same thing uh, That if only Allah wills That's when it will happen And there is nothing that happens in this dunya Without Allah's will So when we say insha'Allah That is not so that it will happen And that we're hoping that Allah will do it Right Because whatever happens Is the will of Allah Right but when we say insha'Allah, it is a reminder for ourselves that nothing happens except with the uh, will of Allah. That you have no might and power except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we say masha'Allah as well, that is also um, uh, it's sort of the same connotation as well. We are reminding ourselves that nothing happens except through the will and permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not that if I don't say this, it's not going to happen. Or if I do say this, it is going to happen. That's not, that's not the meaning of that. All right, so don't get that twisted, guys. Um, uh, Al-Rus 
Al Rus, I love the name Al Rus, mashallah. Barakallah fiqh for your efforts, Jazakallah khair, for being a part of it as well. Makes a huge difference to still feel connected to Masjid during these times. Wallahi, it does. Uh, it does. And we're all feeling it as well. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, reconnect us with the Masjid, inshallah, and allow us to, uh, to visit them once again and pray there once again, inshallah. Very soon. Um, oh, Nadeem, mashallah. Ahlan wa sahlan. We miss you, bro. Long time, no see. Okay, Eamon is asking, can we see prophets uh, in your dreams? Can we see prophets? You mean in my dreams, personally? Can you see them? In my dreams? <laughs> I know that's just a typo. <laughs> um, you can, yeah, of course. You can see prophets in your dreams. I know we can see Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he cannot be impersonated. Is it the same for other prophets? Yeah, it's the same for prophets as well. You can see the prophets in your dreams. You can see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his dreams as well. In your dreams as well. Uh, Mashallah. Okay. Um, Amen. Oh, that's the same question you asked there. Uh, where in the Quran does it say that the whole world was flooded? Uh, it doesn't necessarily the whole world was flooded, uh, but he said that it is said that a flood overtook pretty much everything, um, and no one survived uh, thereafter. لا عاصم اليوم من أمر الله. What does it say? Uh, mm. So Yusuf is saying in Surah Hud it's mentioned that the, the entire world was engulfed in water uh, But I'm not sure of the wording I don't think that's said there But inshallah we'll check that out If you have a mustard seed of belief You eventually go to Jannah And Iblis had belief in Allah then but he disbelieved in Adam alayhi salam and he rejected him and didn't follow him, right? So that was, uh, that was his kufr. And then every, every single messenger after that, right? Causing people to go astray and leading them away from the truth, right? So it's not, an, it's not necessarily a mustard seed of belief in Allah alone. Uh, it is a belief in Allah and what he sent uh, in terms of his guidance, right? It is a belief in uh, what he sent in terms of what is halal and haram, uh, in uh, sort of is uh, what he deems to be moral and immoral, uh, all of those things. Uh, a belief encompasses all of those things. Uh, otherwise, anybody who just believed in a higher power <laughs> will be saved. Uh, can we see prophets in your... Oh, Eamon's asking the same, same question again and again and again. MashaAllah. Okay. So uh, I think that pretty much covers everything. Um, and uh, yeah, inshallah, we'll pick things up uh, from tomorrow, bi'ithnillah, uh, from Surah Taha, uh, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullah uh, khairah for being uh, part and parcel of this, mashallah, and for joining us on this journey. Uh, it's been really good so far, inshallah, and I look forward uh, to it tomorrow. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to benefit from all that has been said uh, and forgive us for any of the shortcomings that have come forth from either myself or from any of us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if any of us has any need, any request from him, that he answers that request and responds to it, and that he fulfills whatever uh, that person uh, requires. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if a person is uh, unwell, that he grants him good health um, and uh, returns him back uh, to wellness. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that anybody who is impoverished and is suffering uh, from poverty, that he alleviates him from that poverty and grants him from his riches above the seven heavens. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us in the way in which he guided his prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his companions, radhwanallahi alayhim, and those who followed him in his way, rahimahumullahu jami'a. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us amongst the prophets and messengers, amongst those who are truthful, uh, and amongst those who have been martyred, and amongst those who are righteous, in Jannah al firdaus al-A'la, Ya Rabb al -Alamin. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to join our families, hearts together with us on, on the Day of Judgment, together, insha'Allah ta'ala, amongst the Prophets and the Messengers, in Jannah al firdaus al-A'la. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who are saved from the fire this Ramadan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ability to see the night of power, the night of Laylat al-Qadr. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ability to make dua Laylat al-Qadr and have that dua be accepted by Him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ability to see Ramadan through and to benefit from Ramadan and to follow on from Ramadan with all that we have benefited uh, from it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
to forgive us, forgive our parents, and to forgive our children and our children's children. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us istiqamah and steadfastness upon the Salat al Mustaqim. Uh, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us uh, guidance from the Quran and a connection with the Quran and to make it the spring of our hearts. Ameen, ameen. Jazakumullah khaira, guys. And I will look forward to seeing you tomorrow, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa